Hi, this is Mac of Mac's List. Find Your Dream Job is presented by Mac's List, an online community where you can find free resources for your job search, plus online courses and books that help you advance your career. My latest book is called Land Your Dream Job Anywhere. It's a reference guide for your career that covers all aspects of the job search, including expert advice in every chapter. You can get the first chapter for free by visiting maxlist.org slash anywhere. This is Find Your Dream Job, the podcast that helps you get hired, have the career you want, and make a difference in life. I'm Mac Pritchard, your host and publisher of Max List. I'm joined by my co-hosts, Becky Thomas and Jessica Black from the Max List team. This week, we're talking about why your bio matters more than your resume. By the time a hiring manager sees your resume, they may already have Googled you. And you probably made your first impression with what you said about yourself in your LinkedIn profile and on other sites that pop up in an online search. Our guest expert this week is William Maruda. He says that your biography matters a lot more than a resume. William explains why and shares his tips for writing a great bio later in the show. Speaking of resumes, Becky's found a new way to present yours. It's a set of templates from Prezi, and this new tool lets you tell your career story in a visually compelling way. Becky shares more in a moment. You take a job with an employer with a poor public reputation, and you do this because you need to pay your bills. Later in your career, you worry that including the company's name on your resume may hurt your own reputation. How should you talk about this job without criticizing your old employer? That's our question of the week. It comes from listener Kelly Baldwin in Portland, Oregon. Jessica shares her advice shortly. As always, let's first check in with the MaxList team and let's turn to Becky Thomas, who's out there every week searching the nooks and crannies of the internet on your behalf, uh, looking for websites, tools, and books you can use in your job search and your career. So, Becky, what have you uncovered for our listeners this week? Um, this week, I'm thinking about, I mean, thinking about the whole uh, resume versus professional bio sort of thing. I think that a big challenge for job seekers is getting through that initial screening process. When uh, you submit a job application, some hiring managers will screen out otherwise really great candidates that maybe didn't meet one of the required qualifications if it's a really formal process. But most are screening resumes with a couple of key questions in mind. Um, I would say, like, could this person do the job? And then also, like, who is this person? And, like, why do they want this job? Um, there's many really smart, capable, highly skilled professionals who really struggle to tell their own story and especially relating their story to the job that they're applying for to answer that key, like, why are you here question. Um, so one problem in the traditional job application process is it's really sort of traditionally formalized and pretty dry. Like more employers um, are realizing that, I think, and they're more open to sort of more creative job applications that may not just be like a PDF of a resume, a PDF of a cover letter, and like a like a work sample or something like that. Um, they're, you know, they're looking for maybe more creative sort of submissions like video resumes, interactive online profiles and portfolios and websites, things that job seekers can use to sort of really show who they are to employers and sort of how they can how they can deliver for that employer. So I found a new way to present your resume on a website called The Muse, which um, has tons of great um, job search and sort of career development advice. And the article was called The Cool New Way to Tell Your Story in Your Job Application. And it outlines a tool to tell your professional story more visually, as well as explaining like transitions in your career in a more compelling way. So it really allows you to tell your whole story. So you may have heard of Prezi. It's a software tool that creates like interactive, um, more sort of animated presentations. Um, some say 
like they like it more than they PowerPoint. Right. Um, and typically they're used to create like slide decks and pitches. I use them a lot in like my agency life back in the day. Mm-hmm. Um, Prezi has reworked some of their existing templates for slide decks to serve job seekers and they're calling them Prezumes. Ooh. <laughs> which I thought you guys would like. Yeah. Good yeah, portmanteau I, there. Yeah. yeah sort of cute. I do love a good, good pun. Yeah. So you get to make your resume more of a story and more of a sort of a presentation. So it gives you a way to explain your career pivots. You can display examples of your work more visually. It sort of like pops in and out of you know different pieces and sort of zooms into things and stuff. So hmm. you can put this all together and then it um, saves as a video. So you can just sort of send it as an attachment um, within with a job application. So it's not so. a replacement for a resume, it's an addition. Right, yeah. Mm-hmm. I think it could be a replacement for a resume if you're just sort of doing networking and you want to send something to someone that you're like, you know, reaching out to for an informational interview or sure. something. Or in a creative industry. Right. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. yeah. Is that like, this would be great for creatives, but I think that it can also be a useful tool if you've like been unemployed for a while, mm-hmm. if you have career gaps or you're changing industries and you need to sort of explain the thread of your career, yeah. this can be a really good way to do it. So, That's awesome. Yeah. I'll include the links in the show notes uh, and there's some examples and stuff and you can try it out for free. So yeah, check it out. Awesome. Yeah. That sounds very interesting. I know, I think all three of us saw a video that a Max List reader had sent us where he, he did a video resume. And mm-hmm. it, I think it ran about two minutes and it yeah. it really made him stand out. And he was looking for a marketing job, but mm-hmm. it was, we get a lot of PDFs and paper resumes here at Max List. And this is the one that I remember that I'm talking about three months ago, three <laughs> months later. Totally. Right? Yeah. Um, and I think that a lot of people are sort of intimidated by the idea of like getting in front of the camera and like talking at somebody yeah, in a video. Sure. But and this we is were never of... nervous about getting behind these microphones, were we? <laughs> oh, never. <laughs> never. <laughs> But yeah. I think this might be a way for those folks who may may not be ready to like put their face on the screen, but they can, you know, visualize their resume in a more interesting sort of animated way. So, yeah, and stand yeah. out, and yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, check it out. Cool. All right. Well, thank you, Becky. And if you've got an idea for Becky, she'd love to hear from you. You can write her at Becky at MaxList.org, and we'd love to share your idea on the show. So let's turn to you, our listeners, and Jessica, uh, what is in the Maxless mailbag this week? Yeah, this week we have a question from Kelly Baldwin here in Portland, and this was an email question, so I'm going to read her what she submitted to us. Kelly asks, my last job was for an organization that has a very bad public reputation. I worked there to pay my bills and not because I agreed with their practices. Now I'm worried that having this company's name on my resume is tarnishing my own professional reputation. How can I separate my own personal brand without trash talking my my former employer? This is a great question, Kelly, because I think a lot of people are, have probably been in this situation. Maybe not. I don't. She doesn't say which kind of which uh, organization she worked for, which I think is good and fine, and we don't need to know. But I think people have had this conundrum before of not sure how to differentiate themselves from the work that they've done. And um, and I think that it's great that she says that she doesn't want to trash talk her former, former employer because... That's really smart. Yeah, don't ever key. do that. Yeah, don't... Mm-hmm. Yeah, and there's no reason to, really. In short, Kelly, I think that my advice would be just demonstrate your values through the other activities and associations and volunteer activities, uh, what not, what other, whatever else you're involved in separately besides what you've done for work. Um, demonstrate who you are and your values and and what you stand for in that way. If um, I'm not exactly sure if this is an immediate past position that she doesn't have anything more recent beyond that, or if this is sort of far in the past and she um, is still just kind of nervous about having that, that employer's name on her resume, um, which in that case, you know, anything past 10 years, you can kind of just get rid of. But um, I understand that people will find find your history. So I think it's good to, to get out in front of it. But yeah, that's, uh, again, demonstrate your values through whatever else you're, you're involved in. Um, get involved in organizations that you're really passionate about that really do stand for your values, if you haven't already. I think also in your interview and even in your cover letter, 
you can be direct and honest, but brief, but very brief about about this of sharing what what you do stand for. And um, again, don't trash talk anyone in the past, but you can mention that um, that you can explain the situation basically that you worked there to pay your bills. Um, you didn't agree to their practices. This is specific to the interview, not in your don't don't get too in, too in depth in your cover letter. But you can um, you can demonstrate your what you again what you stand for your values in your cover letter by you know your storytelling and um, again your activities that you're involved in. Uh, but in your interview, you can just briefly explain the situation and um, that you're excited for the opportunity to work for an organization that you do believe in, assuming that you are now moving into that realm of, of only applying for and interviewing with organizations that you are really excited about and passionate about and, and believe in their values. Um, lastly, it's okay to have a history. You know, we all do. And um, I think it's really good to just focus on what you do stand for and where you're going in the future. And um, that's all I have for that one. Do you guys have anything else to add? I would just add to to focus on the work that you did. Right. Um, I think that when it comes down to it, that potential employer, I mean, depending on the type of organization, if they're a very sort of values-driven company, they might be really turned off by that past experience and in, in mm-hmm. working for that specific company. But I think most employers are just like, can this person do the job that we need them to do? Absolutely. And just like on your resume, just like you can mention the name of the company, but really focus on what you were able to accomplish in your work there. I think that's a great point. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, I think that's spot on. Before, in my past, I worked in, Uh, politics. And so one of the occupational hazards of working for elected officials is sometimes you work for people who later in their career make decisions that lead to ethical lapses or Mm -hmm. even criminal charges. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. And I bring this up because people, my experience has been when I've seen colleagues go through that experience, uh, that employers do make that distinction that you're making Becky, they focus on what you did for that elected official, yep. what, what the work was what and what you accomplished. Yeah. And they're able to see that there's a difference between the staff and, and the person who might have done something uh, unethical. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And again, going back to that, we've all taken jobs for to pay our bills. You know, oh, I don't yeah. think employers, even if they are a highly value-oriented organization, I think that they're not going to think too much about it to like not not interview you or not hire you um, because of that specifically again demonstrate what value you bring and what accomplishments you've had in the past like Mm -hmm. becky said Um, and if you feel like you need to address it address it briefly don't trash talk anyone Mm -hmm. and focus on what you've done and where you're going Mm -hmm. Great. great advice well thank you jessica and thank you kelly for that question uh If you've got a question for Jessica, send her an email. Her address is jessica at maxlist.org. You can also call her listener line. That number is area code 716-JOBTALK. Or post your question on the MaxList Facebook group. And if we use your question on the show, we'll send you a copy of our book, Land Your Dream Job Anywhere. We'll be back in a moment. And when we return, I'll talk with this week's guest expert, William Aruda about why your bio matters more than your resume. I meet with thousands of job seekers each year, people who struggle to find meaningful, rewarding work that matters. I find that many of these people make the same simple mistake in their job search. It's a fatal error that makes the hunt for work longer and harder than it needs to be. What's this critical mistake? People don't have a clear job search goal. You might think it's wise to apply everywhere, but the more you narrow down your job search, the easier everything gets and the happier you will be in your next gig. Stop chasing every lead. Instead, put all your energy into the opportunities that you really want. Of course, setting your goals is easier said than done, especially when all you know is what you don't want to do. That's why I created a new resource that can help. It's called Finding Focus in Your Job Search. 
It's a free step-by-step guide that will help you figure out what you want in your career and in your next job. To get Finding Focus in your job search, visit maxlist.org slash focus. Again, go to maxlist.org slash focus. And now let's get back to the show. Now let's turn to this week's guest expert, William Aruda. William Aruda is credited with turning the concept of personal branding into a global industry. One of the most sought after speakers on the topic, he has delivered hundreds of keynotes in 27 countries on six continents. Combining 25 years of branding experience with his passion for people, he founded Reach, the global leader in personal branding with representatives across the globe. William's latest book, Ditch, Dare, Do, has been called the instruction manual for career success. He's also the author of Career Distinction, Standing Out by Building Your Brand. And he joins us today from Miami Beach in Florida. William, thanks for being on the show. Oh, I'm thrilled to be here, Mac. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to have you. And our topic this week is is biographies. And and you uh, maintain, William, that our bios actually are a lot more important than resumes. And we get questions about resumes all the time. In fact, many people, one of the most frequent things they do during a job search is ask people for advice about resumes. Why do you think the bio is more important than the resume, William? Yeah. So, you know, it's the interesting thing. Um, a lot of people, you're absolutely right. The, the old mindset is the resume is everything. And and that really was the case until we moved into this new world that we're in now uh, with transparency and openness and globalization and, and most importantly, uh, the digital space that we, we live in. And, um, you, you know, your, your resume has now become the proof document, right? It, it, it gives the details that prove what you say in what I think is your most important career document, and that is your bio. And, and the power of your bio comes from the fact that you not only tell people uh, what you do and what you've done, you tell them who you are and why they should care. And you build an emotional connection with them that would make them want to get to know you more. And that's way more powerful than a list of facts, which is pretty much what your resume is. So do people still need a, a resume, William, or can they drop, drop it entirely? You know, the, the world has, here's the, the challenge that we have in the world. Um, nothing ever replaces anything else. Everything is additive, right? When, when um, uh, back in the world where we had newspapers and then the radio came along, the radio didn't kill newspapers, right? And TV didn't kill the radio. And it's the same with career marketing tools, sadly. Uh, we, we still need these old traditional ones like your resume to, to be successful. Um, but if you're going to place emphasis on something, uh, a tool that will be way more valuable to you, I'd focus more time on your bio. So you talked a little bit about some of the benefits of writing a bio, particularly how it allows you to tell a story. Tell us more about that, the importance of storytelling in a job search and and how a bio can help you uh, succeed at that. Yeah. So so first, um, and I'm I'm glad you said the word story. Um, Stories are probably the most powerful tool we have for being able to engage and and interact deeply with with others. And and the reason is a story is made up of things like facts and numbers and figures and logic, along with things like colors and imagery and emotions. And and those uh, two different kinds of, of information are processed in different halves of our brain. And the reason stories are so powerful is because they create synapses between uh, the two halves of our brain. And that's what makes stories memorable and what makes them engaging. So, so first of all, they're more powerful uh, because they, they are engaging our brain in a way that a list of facts would not. Um, the second reason stories are so important is because uh, we, we live in a world where if you want to be successful, if you want to find the ideal job for you, you need to stand out from everyone else who does what you do. And when you look at credentials, uh, really, you're, you're almost making yourself a commodity, not a brand, because your credentials are probably not hugely different from other people who do what you do. But when you tell your story, your story is your own. There's only one story like it. And, and so it's a, it's, a, it's a great way to, to make yourself just jump out of that pile of, with all those other people who do what you do. I'm glad you brought up that point about credentials and uh, no matter how valuable they might be, they are 
in a sense, becoming a commodity because I meet so many people who say, I don't understand why I wasn't chosen for an interview. I met all the qualifications. I had the degree, the certifications, uh, the, the, the desired amount of experience, and yet I still didn't get a call. Oh, I, yeah, I'm so glad you say that because here's the thing. I, you know, the way I look at it from the branding lens is um, we have rational and emotional brand attributes, and rational brand attributes are the table stakes that get us into the game, right? If we are not even going to be considered if we don't have the right degree, the right years of experience, the right kind of experience, and so forth. The problem is other people meet those rational brand attributes, right? The minimum eligibility requirements. The emotional brand attributes are the things that get people excited about you. They're the interesting things that help that you layer on top of those, you know, minimum eligibility requirements, right? That would get people to want to work with you, to want to get to know you, to want to bring you in for that interview. And that's really where the storytelling piece comes in, right? Because that's where you you uh, share all of those great emotionally con connective uh, pieces of information about you. I think many of our listeners have models that they turn to when they create a resume, uh, sure. but they probably aren't familiar or don't have a lot of experience with creating bios. How do you recommend that people start? What, what should they do? Yeah. So, you know, my favorite technique, and I'll, I'll tell you, I, um, so most of my work is public speaking and I'm, I work with big companies and I help lots of people in these companies write their bios. And the process I've used that's been most successful, um, it's really a three-step process. And, and step one is figuring out what you want to say. And the way to do that is to just come up with some content buckets, uh, values and passions, uh, superpowers or strengths, the things you do better than anyone else, uh, differentiation, right? Your quirks, what are, what are the things that, that you can say that nobody else can say, plus your credentials, plus your accomplishments, plus facts, things that you can quantify. And if you look at those individual buckets we just talked about and you start filling them with content, and it doesn't, they don't have to, it doesn't have to sound pretty. You just fill them up. And, and when you're done filling them up, the second piece of this process is to ask yourself, is there anything missing when you look at all of the different buckets? And if so, just pop it in. Is there anything extraneous, things that really aren't important for me to share that are not going to be really valuable to me? Remove those. And, and, and that's step two. And then what you end up with is you have every single piece of information you need to tell your story. And step three is to just start writing that story. And I will tell you that the first two sentences are the most important. So you don't want to start your story out with, uh, you know, Jane is a marketing executive with three years of experience in social media. It needs to be more compelling than that. You're going to get to that part where you talk about what you do, but you want to start out with something that's really um, interesting or intriguing or inspiring or provocative so that people will read on. Can you give us an example of, of what a provocative first or second sentence might be? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, there's a great one, um, uh, a gentleman, um, I just read it recently and it said, um, it said, the thing I'm most proud of in life didn't start with a business plan. It started in a dumpster, period. D don't you want to know the, the rest of that? Yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> right? and, 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 and he talks about um, uh, essentially building a whole business around um, something where he learned they were, they were you know, kind of tearing houses down and throwing them in these dumpsters and how it inspired him to kind of build this, uh, this business. So I, I think it's a great one. There's a... Um, uh, you can start out with your passion, right? The, you know, the thing that gets me up in the morning is X or, um, you know, it took me 15 years to find my dream job and then I did. And so, so, I mean, just thinking about, you know, what's a theme, what's some, what's something that you have to share that will be a little bit interesting or provocative or edgy, um, or, or even just, you know, um, emotionally powerful. Uh, that's the kind of thing that will get people to want to read on. And that's the key, right? Those first two sentences, they're like the, uh, the headline of an ad, right? Its job is to get people uh, you know, glued and wanting to see more. Well, you're inspiring me to go back and, and look at my <laughs> bio on my LinkedIn page because it's pretty prosaic. However, I, I will say my co-host Jessica Black has a, a wonderful uh, uh, headline for her LinkedIn page. It's, I stream... I streamline chaos so that others may shine. Wow. Oh my gosh. Bravo, Jessica. I am impressed. I am. I am, And I'm going to, I'm going to knock on your door to be able to use that as an example. <laughs> okay. 
well, uh, I know she'd be thrilled to, to have you do that. So once you have that bio, how do you use it, uh, particularly when you're in the middle of a job hunt, William? Yeah, so that's the great thing about your bio. I, and this is why I think, you know, people say, oh, my gosh, this is such a tough exercise. And writing is hard for people, right? Um, uh, and so, and then writing about yourself makes it doubly hard. So, so gosh, you've given me this awful task that I have to do. But the good news is when you make it through it, and everyone always does. And, and by the way, I'll give you a, um, Ann Handley, who's a, a content marketing expert. She's a CMO at, at Marketing Profs. And she wants, she, she's really pro- prolific and always writes brilliant stuff. And I said, Ann, how do you do it? And she said, oh, here's my technique. I give myself permission to suck. And any, I just write down stuff and it really could be awful. And I'm totally fine with that. And eventually it turns out great. So, so, you know, if you're struggling, do that and you'll come out with something and it will be great and it will be reflective of who you are. And, um, you know, if you filled it with all the, 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 the content from those buckets, you'll love it. And here's the great news. It's not something that you just use in one place, primarily like your resume. Your, your bio becomes the way that you tell your story when someone asks a question in an interview. Um, so tell me about yourself. Uh, it becomes your LinkedIn profile summary, which will be the most read version of your bio. So it, it can be your 160 character, right? To distill that down or take the most important piece of it and make that your 160 character uh, Twitter bio. And, and so what you'll see and, and even when you're writing cover letters and you want to tell uh, people about yourself, you can pull pieces of this bio. So that the great thing is, um, it seems like one big giant writing project, but I will tell you, it's got so many legs and, and so much opportunity to use it and reuse it and refine it, um, that it will, it will pay dividends for that hard work that you put into it. What I like about the advice you're giving here too, William, is that once you create something, you're delivering the same message, telling the same story and making the same points across multiple platforms, aren't you? And oh, I'm so glad you bring that up too. It's like you're reading my mind. Uh, but, you know, in branding, uh, we, we say the strongest brands in the world can pass a 3C test. Uh, the first C is clarity. You need to be clear about who you are and who you're not. You can't be wishy-washy. The second C, and this is what you're talking about right now, is consistency. Strong brands are always the same. And so even if you're reading these in different platforms and different sizes and whatnot, you know that they're talking about the same person. And, and by the way, just because just everyone's going to say, what's the third C? Uh, the third C is constancy, <laughs> which is about always being visible to the people who are making decisions about you. Good. And I'm also glad you brought up the point about just starting uh, with writing. I I have worked as a writer uh, throughout my career and I had a boss once who just said, you know, there's no such thing as writer's block. You just need to start saying what's inside your head, start typing it out. And it, it might not be very good in the beginning, but the just once you get started, it, it will come. You have to put in the time. Absolutely. And, and you know what you can, it's the kind of thing where, you know, spend 10 minutes today and 10 minutes tomorrow and, um, don't, don't put so much pressure on yourself. And, and at, at a point it will become refined and polished and it'll be, a, it'll be a gem. Great. Any final tips about writing bios that you'd like to share with our listeners? Uh, you know, the, the thing I will say is, um, uh, we are moving from, um, a, a less transparent, workplace to a much more human centric workplace where uh, people are not robots and, and organizations want you to be the unique ingredient that you are to that organization uh, that they otherwise wouldn't have if you weren't there. And, and so with that, uh, what's happening is a lot of versions of your bio will not be in the third person. They'll be in the first person, um, especially, for example, your LinkedIn profile, right? My, my LinkedIn profile starts out with, um, I had no intention of being an entrepreneur, period, right? And then I go on to tell the story how I started my personal branding business. Uh, every, let's, for your LinkedIn profile, let's be clear. People know that you've written it yourself, so it's a little disingenuous to write in the third person. Um, and second, when you start talking with the first person, you're engaging in a conversation with the reader. So I would say get comfortable with the first person because not every version of your bio will use the first person, but a lot of times it is the right approach. And I think tone can make a big difference often in business, but also when we're out looking for work, we adopt these very formal, almost stilted ways of writing because uh, I think we think it 
that's how we should uh, communicate in business or when applying for a job. And often that's not in our best interest, is it? Oh, 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 gosh, that's exactly right. And we, we, we've we convinced ourselves in our head, we've made up these rules that really don't exist. And And if you want your bio to really engage people, make it not like those formulaic, don't try to copy someone else's, make it really be you. And don't think that it has to have all this jargon and, uh, you know, business lingo. It, it really, it, it should be reflective of you, the human being, not some, you know, made up robot that's following a whole bunch of rules. Okay. Well, it's been a great conversation, William. Now tell us what's coming up next for you. Uh, well, you know what? We're, we're just about to launch it. We're putting our finishing touches on this really cool product. At, at, I have a new company called careerblast.tv uh, and it's, it's essentially tools that career minded people need. And we're about to launch a big, uh, everyone's biggest question. How do I write a great LinkedIn profile? And so that's our first product that we're, we're launching um, is how do you in, in four videos, how do you make it happen? So that's kind of our big new thing. Well, terrific. Uh, I know people can learn more about you and, and your LinkedIn products and other services by visiting careerblast.tv. And we'll be sure to include uh, links in the show notes. William, thanks for being on the show today. Oh, Matt, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. And likewise, take care. We're back in the studio with Jessica and Becky. Uh, what are some of your reactions to my conversation with William? That was great. He, uh, I enjoyed that one. It was. I, it, I like all of them, but of th- th- this one was a fun one. Yeah, he just has such great energy, and he made so many really great points, and I loved all of his. Um, I think what really struck me is that this feels so innate, but it was great for him to pull out concrete pieces of advice to, to do this well. Um, because I, I do think like your bio is really important and we don't really think about that very often, but as someone who, um, collects bios for our event panelists and things like that, um, you know, you use your bio in multiple capacities and having something already created and something both compelling that you can, I liked, I guess I liked his, um, his focus on, being able to create something, but then you get to use it in multiple capacities, um, that it's, it's already there. And then you just pull out pieces of it to, to fit in whatever you need it to. So sometimes you're going to use the full bio as it was created, you know, maybe on your LinkedIn profile or whatever, but then you'll pull specific lines or, or, um, phrases to use in your cover letter or to use, uh, to be on a, an event panel or to use as your elevator pitch type of a thing, you know? So mm-hmm. you don't necessarily have to use the entire thing, but I liked that he he shared that and really broke it down and made it less, like, th- threatening is not the right word, but, like, serious, kind of just, it's it's, I think a lot of people get so in their heads of, like, I have to create this perfect bio that's going to be seen by hundreds of people and I'm going to, you know, and yes, it is a big deal. You want to create something. You do want to get it right. You want to create something that's really powerful and really wonderful, but I think that a lot of people get caught caught up in the, I have to make it perfect right away. And I liked that he was saying, you know, do some brainstorming. Put put all of your information, your passions, your accomplishments, your your work history, all of all of you into these different buckets, and just do the brainstorming first, and let it kind of s- just see what pops out, see what kinds of mm-hmm. um, what kinds of like threads come together, and tell your story that way rather than rather than like sitting down and being like, okay, well the first line has to be really compelling. So what's that first line? Mm-hmm. Let's start by going go backwards first and do the brainstorming. Think about it all. Really, you know, get get truthful with yourself of like, here's who I am and here's what I, you know, what are the, what are the words I want to use to describe myself, that sort of thing. And then, and then have it come naturally and Mm -hmm. it's going to be an evolution. So I think that 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 is another good thing too, is that, um, you know, he mentioned 
it's you're gonna just you're gonna hone it over a while. Yeah. It's not gonna come out right away, but you can start with something and then have it grow and, and evolve. So yeah. anyway, I just I liked so much about it. I could talk about it forever. Yeah. Yeah, that was great. I agree with all of that. I think it's so important to not like put that much pressure on yourself when you're first sitting down to write a bio about yourself because yeah. I think people are just too close to it sometimes. It's like, I don't know what to say about myself, but sit down with it. You really do know how to talk. You know who you are. You know? Yeah, um, yeah. And, and I think taking that pressure off, like you said, is the key component of of things. Like, yeah. Just trust yourself that you know how to tell your own life story right? and, and you don't have to think so hard about it. Yeah, yeah. And just just the fact that telling a story is so much more compelling than listing out your oh my credentials gosh. and yeah. That yeah. every all of your peers have the like same or similar credentials as you and like your personal story is what's going to help you stand out. Yeah, I, I, that's perfect. Yeah. And one more thing kind of related to that is that like we all have like the the part about the hook that he was talking about mm-hmm. that um I think Again, like I said before, people get kind of caught up in their heads of like, what am I going to say to catch people? But we all have something that is really interesting about ourselves. Mm-hmm. We do. So, yeah. And so just finding that thing that I, I liked his examples that he gave of, you know, I th- I did Those this, opening this, lines. I did this for yeah. 15 years and then I decided, you know, then I realized my true calling or whatever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we all have those those things. So find a way to tell tell your story. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I I also liked his emphasis on the personal and he offered a strategy that I hear a lot of job seekers say they want and they which is how do I stand out? Mm-hmm. And and by telling your story and doing it consistently across multiple platforms to your point Jessica, that's a way of 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 getting attention and standing out and it does take some time but I think it will pay dividends. I will also say about William, uh, you were talking about editing bios and how you look at bios. And of course, yeah. I edit the bios for all of our guests. And his was, I think, the first, I just might have changed a word or two. Yeah. <laughs> his was very tightly written and I thought very effective. Great. Yeah. yeah. So kudos to him. And not surprising not considering surprising, this of is uh, one yeah. of the many things that he's really good at. Yeah. Well, terrific. Well, uh, did you have a final point? Yeah, Jessica? one more thing. I just um, to reiterate to kind of spin upon what you just mentioned a few seconds ago. Um, I liked his point about not trying to copy or like fit your bio into like right. a predetermined structure, um, because I think that's another thing that people kind of get caught up in their heads about. Like, I don't know how to write a bio, or like, what is it supposed to look like? And it doesn't really have to look. It can look like whatever you want it to. Yeah. Tell your story and and just let it go. Yeah. So he had a good three part structure for how to write it. Yeah, but it's it is going to tell your story. So every bio is going to be different for mm-hmm. every person. Well, great. Well, thank you both, and thank you, William, for joining us, and. Thank you, our listeners, for downloading today's episode of Find Your Dream Job. Now, if you're still working through the first step of your job search, and that's figuring out what it is you want to do, I think you'll benefit from my new goal-setting resource, Finding Focus in Your Job Search. You can download it on our website. Just go to maxlist.org slash focus. And by doing so, you'll get a free step-by-step guide to setting goals. Again, that URL is maxlist.org slash focus. And join us next Wednesday when our special guest will be Paulina Selyutin. She's the host of the I Want Her Job podcast. And she's going to share with us three lessons she's learned from 65 career conversations. Until next time, thanks for letting us help you find your dream job. 